Good morning and welcome to our uh, Q1 member meeting industry update session. Um, as you know, if you've been around the Alliance for a little while, when we do our member meetings, we try to bring in uh, you know, different speakers from around the industry to address different topics. And uh, I'm quite excited for the lineup that we have for you this morning. Uh, it'll be 90 minutes and we'll take care of some housekeeping on the next slide, please, Stephanie. Oh, welcome and good morning. I think we've done that. Sorry, the next one, just uh, as a reminder, um, you know, by uh, joining the session, you've agreed to the UNGO Alliance's privacy policy. Um, we are recording the event uh, for our use and distribution. And we uh, uh, asked our speakers as well, our presenters, as well as the panelists for the final session. Um, and they are uh, going to take questions as time allows, so I'd encourage you as the presentations are ongoing, log your questions into the chat function um, and we'll queue those up again. We'll, we'll uh, see how, how time goes, but uh, you know, uh, they've generously offered to field a question or two as we go along. So uh, again, we've got a really good lineup for this morning. We're going to have three uh, different keynotes, really touching on three very important use cases for ONGO. So, um, and we, we've got some great speakers lined up for that. Uh, so those will probably take about the first 60 minutes of our 90. And then the final 30, we're going to have a panel talking about the path to 5G in ONGO. Um, uh, and I'll introduce Alan and then he'll introduce the panelists. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, and tee up the first session. So um, Stephanie, if we could go to the next slide, pleased to introduce um, our first speaker, um, Peter Murray, who's the executive director or an executive director with uh, Dense Networks. Um, as it says, uh, Dense is a, a social think tank. They do a tremendous amount of um, consulting and strategy work around. Uh, different practices, but they have a, a very well-developed practice in the smart cities, connected uh, cities space, looking at municipal um, connectivity needs. Um, they've had been doing a, uh, a whole series on this over the last, I think, year or 18 months. And so we're really excited to uh, to have Peter here to share some of their uh, findings. And, and um, yeah, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Peter. Thank you very much for uh, you know, your time here this morning with us. Thanks so much uh, for the introduction, Dave. Uh, um, disappointing, of course, we're not live uh, in, in New Orleans. Uh, I actually had invited my wife to join me, uh, but uh, soon enough, I think we'll be out on the road. And uh, if we could, um, uh, next slide. Yeah, so as Dave mentioned, uh, I, I'm Pete Murray. Uh, I'm the executive director of Dense Networks. and. Uh, we focused um, on how connectivity impacts this journey to the smart city. And smart city has many applications, many definitions, uh, depending on who, uh, if you're talking to a city manager, a politician, or somebody in public work. So I'll take us through uh, some of those applications. But first, a little bit about uh, dense networks. Uh, next slide. Most uh, folks in the industry. Uh, know us from uh, the Connected Cities Tour. Uh, we started that back in 2016. And as you can see with this calendar, um, we've got a full slate of events. Uh, and we're actually partnering with the Smart Cities Council uh, for these events. So in Coral Gables on the 24th, we'll focus on the technologies that are enabling uh, smart cities. Uh, we'll, and on the 25th, we'll focus on sustainability and resilience and the mayor will, uh, will be receiving award from the uh, Smart Cities Council. So our focus with these events is to get roughly 80 people uh, in the room. Um, it's a 9 a.m. to roughly 2, 2 p.m. Uh, with a catered lunch. So two or three panels, a couple of keynotes um, in Coral Gables. We'll have mayor, we'll have the CIO, we'll have the CIO of the county. Um, we'll have Geoverse, uh, one of your members is going to be joining us. Um, later in Scottsdale, we'll have Dell and, and the, um, uh, the city of Tucson will keynote. Uh, we talk about broadband and we'll talk specifically about how wireless and uh, CBRS is a, is a really strong edge solution uh, for broadband. Um, so um, next slide, please. 
So what I want to talk about first, uh, one of the hats I wear is I'm a NTIA federal broadband grant judge. Uh, this morning I reviewed two um, that were in the digital equity uh, category. Um, so right now there is a gold rush and it's a very well-funded gold rush uh, to supply broadband. Uh, perhaps one of the only uh, positive side effects of all this um, isolation and uh, stay at home, uh, e-learning, telehealth, all of that has emerged and all across po the political sphere, everyone has, uh, all the leaders, mayors, governors, everyone has a platform to address broadband and to address digital equity. And so much of the conversation is tailored around fiber optics. But now as I see a lot of these unserved, what they're intended to do is uh, provide services to the unserved and the underserved uh, markets, which are uh, areas where fiber hasn't been built and for many good reasons. Um, so uh, no chance that fiber is gonna be able to solve this problem alone. So the CBRS spectrum is an ideal um, solution. So how, how do you get involved uh, in, in getting into this mix? Um, almost every medium to large size city has a committee um, on smart cities. Um, there's a broadband office in every state. Um, so if anyone wants to reach out, I'll, I'll provide my contact, but I might be able to provide you with a detailed roadmap about how to go about it in your own state. But every state will be getting $100 million later this year to kick off um, the provision of broadband to the un and underserved markets. As I said, it's a chief tenant now of the smart city movement. Uh, next slide, please. So what I showed you there was all the different programs in the NTIA bucket where I'm a judge, um, but there's additional funds, um, RDOF and, and the USDA, the, this is a traditional annual program. Um, the biggest one that's impacting broadband is the government will provide a $30 subsidy to anyone who is um, at 200% of the poverty level or lower. Um, so people in the 60,000, 70,000 range um, can qualify to get $30 subsidized per month towards their broadband for up to five years. Uh, very simple um, uh, sign up process. Um, and it's another way to help subsidize um, the broadband that can be provided across uh, CBRS. Um, Next slide, please. So th that said, as I mentioned, I'm a broadband, uh, federal broadband judge, um, and these there are many, many programs, but um, the rescue funds are the first dollars to actually be issued. And every county, um, almost every county, receives a bucket of millions of dollars um, to utilize, or the state did and is now distributing it. Um, I live in Orange County, Florida. Um, this is a map of, of our uh, territory. This is all the rural area here and, and out here. Um, I'm a, a consultant to this county and, and we're now issuing an RFP for broadband services, um, all utilizing fiber. And then we're gonna issue a, a, um, an RFP for a broadband uh, wireless network uh, over the county um, to provide both IoT services for county use but also to act as a distance learning and telehealth network for our um, uh, less advantaged people in the county. Um, next slide, please. So I focused in on broadband and all the funding uh, that's available, um, which is really the, uh, you know, a very highlighted part of whether it's Republican or Democratic, everyone's trying to uh, solve this issue. So in your city, in your town, um, and particularly if you're rural, um, you're going to have uh, way more application uh, for these funds because that's where they're trying to deliver the funds, where the services aren't available. And the main reason they're not available is cost of fiber optics. Uh, particularly across um, you know, some of these more rural states. Um, okay, so the traditional smart city, um, I use this slide, OUC. OUC is the utility in um, Orlando, uh, Orange County, uh, or at least part of the, the uh, county. Um, and uh, inside of that, they, they classified 
um, what they see as the chief tenants of the smart city. Um, and they partnered with the city and actually had issued an RFP and, and hired a project management firm to help them uh, deploy the various applications. So these are some of the key areas of focus. Uh, next slide. Okay, this slide is, is very effective because what it does is it boils, boils down what, um, you know, specifics, right? So from OUC standpoint, they looked across the city and they said, who are we servicing? And they looked at the rental market. They looked at the uh, residential market, um, you know, single family homes. They looked at office and retail. They looked at the industrial. And then they looked at, particularly here, we have a huge hospitality. So they looked into that and then they they brought in, you know, what are some of the solutions? And this one happens to be around resilience and sustainability. Uh, microgrid, right, is, is, is emerging energy um, uh, technology. But the point is they really got down to the granular level and, and uh, looked at what it is they could offer um, and then um, applied it to the different constituencies. Then the, there was some public meetings, and the, they're very much uh, involved now in the EV charging. Um, there's a, a very strong network for autonomous and electric shuttles here. So again, getting involved um, and, and particularly poking at your utility uh, will probably find a couple of people that are dedicated to these efforts, uh, particularly if it's a mid-sized to larger market. Um, next slide. So this is my favorite slide. Um, this is uh, from the city of San Jose. It's maybe about three and a half to four years old now, uh, but it still applies. Um, the street light at the center of uh, the smart city movement. Um, uh, somebody was trying to get in and texting me over and over. Um, to, you know, is at the center of the smart city movement, hence the, the cooperation with the utility. The question is, you know, who owns the uh, pole? Uh, does the utility own it? Does uh, Department of Transportation own it? Does the city own it? Um, are they private poles as we start to see more and more, um, particularly for telecom use? Um, so this, the city uh, leveraged the use of their poles. Many cities start their uh, journey on the smart uh, city um, project with a smart street lighting, LEDs, uh, upgrades of sometimes of the poles as well as the lights. But as they get more sophisticated, they start to recognize what can be part of that pole. And of course, our uh, small cell, um, but again, geo, um, I should say, uh, uh, CBRS has an application um, throughout the city. So the question is, you know, are you on towers and your rooftops or on your own poles or, on your own, or are you on all of them? Um, and then, as I say, Internet of Things, which again is a great application uh, whether it's water sprinklers, lights, uh, cameras uh, for the CBRS spectrum. So um, look at your city, think about the poles. Uh, when I travel to a city, uh, my wife uh, points out uh, scenic uh, hotspots and I, I point out literal hotspots. Um, so um, it's, there's, there's actually a, a really strong way into the market if you can get with the utility or you get with the smart cities team. Um, next slide. So when you break it down for our purposes, you know, and when I when I consult with a city or I, I talk to a city, I really break it down to these components of the digital infrastructure um, that are essential to be managed if you're going to create a connected and then therefore smart city. Remember the number one rule, you cannot be a smart city if you're not a connected city and there's multiple methods. So everything from municipal Wi-Fi um, to um, pri private LTE networks. Um, LoRa is, is a, a competition for the IoT elements in the cities. Uh, it's a wide area, low bandwidth um, service. Um, and then obviously you wanna know where fiber is deployed um, to help light up uh, the CBRS. Uh, next slide. And these are this is kind of a quick summary of um, with div digital infrastructure, the type of applications that can be addressed. And almost all of these, I would say, um, other than the connected vehicle, 
have application uh, utilizing CBRS, private LTE, and then your roadmap to 5G. Um, fiber is not going to be able to be deployed uh, to, to satisfy all these applications. Not every home is going to get fiber. Um, so there is uh, a, the CBRS spectrum is a really underutilized, under discussed element of um, about the 35 uh, applications for grants that I reviewed in the last four or five months. Um, only one of them used CBRS. It was on an, uh, an Indian reservation in Arizona, uh, which I think even Geoverse was behind. Um, so I, I've run into them uh, out there, but um, haven't seen it in the discussion as, as often as I think it should be. So um, one of the, the areas uh, I'm going to collaborate with the Ongo Alliance this year, and you folks are going to be welcome to be part of the audience as well as be on the panels uh, of the events. I showed you the schedule earlier, um, but you know we'll be in Coral Gables, we'll be in Scottsdale, we'll be in LA, we'll be in Chicago, we'll be in New York, and we'll focus on both the smart city and we'll focus on the smart buildings because ultimately it's capacity and coverage that enable that creates the bandwidth that enables these applications. Um, next slide. Yeah. Okay. So here, here's my contact information. Um, as I said, we consult with both cities and companies. Uh, we run the tour. There'll be right now a, a total of 11 events uh, throughout the country. Um, the uh, the schedule is up on our website. Um, if there are questions uh, available, I'm happy to address um, any questions around the smart city. Um, I'm trying to open up this chat. Um, okay, it doesn't appear there were any questions. Um, so, I've seen any from the um, audience yet, Pete? But uh, maybe, maybe I could tee one up to you if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean that was a that was a, a great presentation. Thank you. And uh, I, I think even on that final slide or the slide prior to this, you had a range of sort of the use cases, everything from you know lighting, traffic control, um, you know uh, parking sensors, et cetera, et cetera. Are, are there any particular ones that you really see driving some of these early deployments, or are, are there some that are you know pretty? prevalent or almost ubiquitous across, you know, uh, the, the different municipalities and cities you talk to? Yeah, well, the certainly the issue of e-learning and providing that, you know, broadband, uh, definition of broadband is 25 by 3 right now with the FCC. Um, when I'm consulting, the goal is usually 100 by 20. Um, but that, that basic application of providing an e-learning or telehealth network that can be utilized, that's in the mix right now is a discussion point. But from the IoT side of it, um, Las Vegas deployed a network. They were one of the first. They got literally a million dollars thrown at them right at the, you know, the, um, um, at, at the end of a budget cycle and said, see if you can provide the connectivity. And uh, they took it pretty far. They've uh, partnered now with Cox Cable, uh, but they, they've, um, uh, just done some real good blocking and tackling. So they have water sprinklers um, on, on the network now. Um, they have um, some device tracking. Uh, they're trying to um, uh, merge it into, merge, uh, no pun intended, but into some of their traffic controls. So they're experimenting with that, yeah. which, you know, that, that's um, got its, you know, life safety issues. So uh, you can't, you, you know, they, they've gone a little slower with that. Um, there are applications um, around sound now, uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, we're going to be there in April, and they're winning an innovation award from the Smart Cities Infrastructure Information uh, Innovation Forum, and they're doing a noise, um, uh, basically just tracking DBs with a, a receiver outside of um, major establishments, and it tracks if they go over the no or there's a complaint. A text is sent to the owner or manager of the the establishment to turn it down, and they're given 15 minutes rather than to respond with a police officer. Initially, they're giving them uh, these uh, warnings, and you know, at, at one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, police officers are busy, right? We really don't need them standing in a loud institution arguing about sound. Um, so, um, a lot of these very granular 
um, not so um, sexy, but very, very um, helpful to public works and utilities. Uh, that, that's what we're starting to see emerge. And Vegas was one of the pioneers along with Tucson. Thanks. That that's interesting, and, and and it's interesting. You mentioned the um the whole sound monitoring and don't dispatch the police, you know, until you've given them some warnings and automate all that. And I remember hearing about you know some municipalities that were looking at um, monitoring of trash receptacles, right? Don't don't send the garbage guys out, you know, if the things are a quarter or half full. Wait until you know, and then try to optimize the pickup. Um, so it seems to be kind of reducing overhead in that way. You know, and I, I actually did a big belly was the big brand. Right. And I, yeah. I did some work with them. And, you know, the long pole in, in, in the functioning the after this sexiness wore off and all that excitement of, you know, these automated cans. It was the cost of keeping communications to them. That was the gating factor that many government governments said, ah, oh, we don't want to pay that bill to keep them on the network. Um, so again, a, a geo versus, and I see I use geo versus, I, I've seen their projects, but the, the CBRS spectrum um, really has a very practical application and you can layer these devices, very low bandwidth, just need the connectivity. Um, and that's why I say LoRa is really the competition for that. Those, they put up a canopy, you know, gateways and, and the cities, uh, I'm seeing my county is looking at potentially adopting some sort of countywide wireless network for all these different devices and things that are out there. Great. Well, thanks very much, Pete. Um, really appreciate that. I think we're going to move on. If you do have other questions for Pete, again, please put them into the uh, the chat function. I think he's going to stick around uh, a little well, and bit. The, and the 10-second the commercial is, remember, we're going to collaborate. So all you Ongo uh, members, we welcome you to be part of all these events and densenetworks.com is where the calendar is. And we probably just spammed you today. We did our first uh, email blast. So thanks again, Dave. Thank you. And we look forward to that collaboration. So uh, thanks again to Pete. Okay. So uh, if we could go to the next slide, please, Stephanie. Um, so switching from smart uh, connected cities, we're going to zero in on the, the enterprise use cases. And I'm really excited to introduce the next speaker, uh, Norman Fekret with um, Imagine Wireless. Imagine um, they, they're a technology consulting firm at the intersection, and I love this, they're at the intersection of 5G, CBS, um, IoT, and blockchain. So, um, yeah, that, that is about as, uh, as avant-garde as you can get when it comes to connectivity, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and they, uh, they do a tremendous amount of consulting. I know they've done some market forecast around the private opportunity for the enterprise. And so we're really excited to, uh, to welcome Norman um, here to give us a presentation on enterprise opportunity for Ongo. And again, please uh, log any questions you have. Uh, Norman, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Dave, <clears throat> and Peter. Thank you for uh, that great overview of smart cities. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about, um, you know, the Ongo Alliance CBR spectrum when it comes to the enterprise. Um, and for those of you that don't know about Imagine Wireless, uh, I guess shame on me. Um, uh, I'm not doing my job. But we we seem to be involved in most of the efforts out there on how to monetize. Uh, this innovation spectrum band. Um, where is the revenue? Um, when is it coming? And uh, what's the product look like? How does it go to market? So we've done a lot of the kind of revenue business case strategy, product strategy, and go to market strategy work for you know several of the um, service providers out there. Um, so uh, um, so we're glad to be here. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so let's get into it a little bit. So we're gonna. I wanted to make this a little bit of a different discussion, so please um, do log questions. Um, we're going to have a pretty strong point of view um, based on our experience, and I hope that it generates um, some good thought capital and dialogue. Um, so why don't we get into it? Let's go on. Go ahead to the next slide. <clears throat> the, the, the topics that we kind of wanted to talk about today is um, everyone always asks, like, okay, you know, when is when is this thing going to take off, right? When is CBRS going to take off? When are when is the market going to really adopt this and go after it? When is it going to adopt 4G versus 5G? Which industry verticals are going after this? Uh, what is the what's our adoption point of view? So we're going to talk about, you know, how we see things adopting um, in the marketplace 
and also what the blockers are. Um, and that's probably where we're gonna spend more time on the pushback and the questions and how this community is going to market and what the blockers are and the challenges are to get these um, the points, the proofs of, proof of concepts to actually go to production. Um, so that's the first topic. The second one is we got to um, evolve ourselves and sell more business value um, versus just technology speeds and feeds. So I want to spend some time talking about um, use cases, the traditional network use cases we see, but really translating those into enterprise business value. <clears throat> because for an enterprise to open up a PO to approve the spend on a new network, <clears throat> they have to have an ROI. And if they don't have that, then you'll be stuck in proof of concepts um, forever. <laughs> the third one is um, <clears throat> really CIO first. And uh, if you have not seen a, a well-written RFI from an enterprise, I would encourage you to, to reach out to us or to get your hands on one. And you'll see really how the enterprise looks at um, how they define their KPIs, how they want to quantify value, and how it needs to be integrated. Um, and we have a list of some things that the service provider needs to get right um, and the technology provider. So those are our topics. Um, hope they're on track with everybody and um, hope it's a good discussion. Why don't we go ahead and get into it? Um, so our point of view on the next slide here, if you don't mind, is um, really what's, what's, what's the adoption going on out there today? So we try to split this up into a couple categories. First one is um, just CBRS-based solutions, right? The innovation band is, you know, could be used for so many different things, right? And there's a lot of confusion when people talk about CBRS, to be honest with you. Is it about a private network? Is it, you know, is it a neutral host? Is it fixed wireless? Is it whatever? There's so many. But um, what I would do is I would, um, you know, think about um, the market share of CBRS. And what we what we see is a lot of this is, um, going to be enterprise private mobile networks. Um, so when you look at the overall market share for CBRS, we're thinking uh, about half of it or so is going to be for specifically for enterprise private networks. And this is the market share. Um, and it's really based on a lot of square foot footage and a lot of uh, need in the um, enterprise space, um, industrial manufacturing companies, um, warehouses, fulfillment centers, et cetera. Um, the, um, the, the second one is neutral host network. So not traditional neutral host, carrier neutral host. This is CBRS neutral host. Uh, we see this about being 10 to 20% um, of the overall market share for CBRS. We see fixed wireless being about 10 to 20% of the market share also. Um, and we also see corporate liable, which I don't think a lot of people talk about. Um, you know, it's, it's basically where you have a corporate liable devices and we think CBRS is a good proponent for corporate liable replacement uh, the, with, a, with a roam out. Um, and we think that's being about five to 10% of the market. So, um, so um, that's how we kind of see the market share. I hope that generates a lot of discussion of thought capital. Not everyone's gonna agree with that. Um, we also get asked a lot of times, okay, what's the solution adoption timing? When is 5G gonna take off? How is it gonna look? you know, et cetera. So we wanted to talk about, um, you know, where we see those four areas taking off. When you look at enterprise private networks today, there's, <clears throat> in 2021, you know, there was a whole bunch of proof of concepts, a couple of deployments, but there's a very leading edge, not in scale. Everyone's asking, when's this coming? When's it coming? Um, but, you know, 2021 and the beginning of 2022, the first half is gonna be a lot of proof of concepts. Um, I know we want this to happen sooner, but we kind of see the later half of 2022, we'll start seeing a lot of the full deployments of enterprise private mobile networks ramping and scaling um, much larger in 2023. I mean, we'll get into what some of the um, delays are in, in the next slide or two, but that's kind of what, you know, how we see it. Uh, neutral host networks that are CBRS is, are just evolving right now. They're just kind of starting. We're seeing some proof of concepts out there. But at least we're getting some MNO support, right? So I think some of the mobile network operators are saying, okay, our, our subscribers can go on this CBRS based neutral host. We certify it. This is a certified you know, vendor. Our quality is and customer service and quality services is going to be just as good as our network. And we're starting to see some buy in there, which is good. We think that's going to continue to ramp up. 
fixed wireless um, early adopters um, you know they they've done the WiMAX replacement we've seen a lot of fixed wireless um, in that moving forward so I think that that was kind of early adoption side on CBRS and corporate liable replacement you know we're just seeing some some activity now and I think Facebook's been one of the leaders in this with um, you know deploying a full CBRS private network in their campus uh, and I think we'll see you know large corporate liable campuses start to evaluate this because you know when I worked in my past as a consultant um, at larger consulting firms we uh, would go around with a tele telecom expense management um, practice and go help these enterprises reduce their telecom spend and uh, CBRS private networks can definitely reduce their spend on the M&Os when it comes to corporate liable contracts. Um, the third area there is the adoption on the um, the technology and the timing of adoption. LT is now, you know, it meets most of the requirements, right? So, um, you know, if a customer is saying, hey, we're going to wait for 5G, I would really question them on if they really have a latency requirement there or a KPI that LT can't meet. And if they do, I would push them to say, hey, there's an upgrade path. Let's get started now. Um, so, you know, I think having that upgrade path is helpful um, and, uh, um, and necessary. Um, on the 5G side, I think, you know, it's, it's still a little early. I mean, the, from a technology perspective, you know, it's there um, from, a, from a device uh, and from a, um, need, a real need in the industry. You know, I think it's evolving still. I think everyone likes talking about 5G and private 5G because it's cool. But LT is a good way to make money now. And I think 5G, you'll see some pox towards the end of this year, mostly in 2023, with fuller deployments um, in 2023 and 24. Um, and a lot of this data in market share, you know, it's based on our ex experience and um, perspective. Uh, we've done this kind of market opportunity development um, for the past four years um, before, you know, this was really kind of cool. And, um, you know, we've based this on our opinion. Um, so you're not going to go find some study um, that that backs this up this is our point of view okay um, but welcome to discuss that um, so any uh, any thoughts or questions on that if not we'll we'll move forward but that's kind of our perspective on how the market's adopting CBRS at the moment next slide please um, and then who's going to get the market share right so this is another question we have too okay if it's a you know, a billion dollar market out there, if that's not the number, but I'm just saying, um, who's gonna get this? And, um, you know, the way that I we kind of think about this is at number five here on this list, you'll see, you know, we think that the mobile network operators, you know, may get about a 20% market opportunity. So out of that 1 billion, maybe $200 million um, of, of that, it's mostly based on network slicing that they will get enterprise private mobile networks. And that's a lot to do with private and public um, integration is key for them. But when you go talk to a head of OT or a CIO of a, a, a fulfillment center or a big campus or an industrial manufacturing company, if you go there with a um, integrator with a, a mobile network operator, my experience is you know, you'll, you'll get thrown out half the time, um, if not more. Uh, they um, These head of IT and OT, CTO, CIO of these enterprises do not want a mobile network operator in their enterprise network. And they also don't really you know, want um, anything leaving uh, the campus in a lot of um, places. Uh, they want everything on premise. Um, so our perspective is that the, the mobile network operators on the network slice will get about 20%. And that leaves about 70 to 80% of that $1 billion TAM, as an example, available for others. And based on that, we see a lot of the Wi-Fi and DAS managed service providers will get a significant, um, you know, market share. So that may make some people happy, um, you know, on this panel today. Um, and um, but it's true because it's an upsell. They're a trusted delivery partner. They've done it for Wi-Fi or DAS as a managed service, and it's a good upsell opportunity and to extend into other verticals. On number three here on this list, we also think the enterprise as a service providers. These are the big SIs. We'll go there um, and get a significant market share also. And that reason is because they speak enterprise value and they know enterprise integration and they'll bring along you know, their set of technology vendors. So these are the big SIs 
Accenture, Tech Mahindra, and others. Number four on this list is you'll get some industry vertical specialists, and I kind of pick on Siemens here in healthcare. You're going to see, you know, some of these industry vertical specialists put together the solution with the right solution partners and kind of get a good percentage of market share in a specific industry vertical or two. Um, and they will be successful in um, those specific industry verticals, but not really um, outside of those, um, which means they will have smaller market share. Um, but the overall point here is if you're an, a technology provider or a solution provider like an Ethernet switch company or you know a technology provider core or RAN, you know you really have to sell through um, trusted integrators um, and you need to pick them wisely. Right now there's a very complicated set of integrators that are all scrambling to try to say, oh, we can do enterprise private mobile networks. We've got a CBRS solution. It's still early. There's a lot of people that are um, you know, saying they can do this and they're all at different levels of maturity from a product perspective and a implementation perspective and support perspective. Um, so that's kind of our view on how we see the enterprise market being um, divided up. Um, I think the news here is um, DAS Wi-Fi providers will get a big chunk and these um, systems integrators will also get a pretty big chunk on that. Welcome to any thoughts or comments on that. Um, moving on to the next slide. Now here's, some, I want to spend most of our time on this. This is, um, you know, our experience really talking to um, CIOs and head of OTs, um, um, operational folks in the industry. And this may not be, you know, um, you know, some people may not like this, but you know, this is straight up what we're hearing. So I wanted to share it. Um, so what, what everyone says, why aren't we adopting, why isn't market adopting this technology yet? What's the problem? It, you know, it's not us, right? It's gotta be them. But what we see out there is you have, when you have telecom people selling telecom solutions to the enterprise, you get this, okay? We're missing them. We're missing them. We speak from a telecom vernacular perspective and we're, we teach, speak speeds and feeds and coverage capacity, spectrum, SAS, you know, um, you know, MEC, Core, RAN, all this stuff. And if you're from the enterprise side, you know, to be honest with you, you don't really care about all of the technology there. You do, some are more mature than others, right? But you have to speak enterprise value to the enterprise. You have to speak not in network use cases, but in enterprise business levers. Um, and that's, um, you know, something that, you know, I wanna hit on over and over and over again. I think it's critical to um, getting um, CBRS-based deployments um, completed and sold um, at enterprises. Number two on the list is enterprise integration. You know, um, I you know you get kind of tired of hearing that oh we have a mech, and so we're integrated to the enterprise. And when you go talk to a CIO or head of OT, that's an island, um, a standoff, standalone island to the enterprise. There's no integration, right? You need cloud native APIs that are gonna to integrate to enterprise architecture systems. And I use ServiceNow as an example, right? ServiceNow is, you know, if you're a telecom person, you may not know a lot about it, but enterprises use it for their EMS and their fault management and their operation centers. And they wanna be able to um, get errors in, um, and have a network management view of their enterprise networks, um, including a private LT or 5G network. So having those right hooks into the enterprise um, architecture um, is critical. And if you don't have them, at least show that, you know, you have a path to get there and that you understand that it's important. Because I think if you don't address these things on this list, you know, you're going to, if they're doing an RFI or RFP, you're just going to go down and lower and lower in the list. The third one is, you know, costs, right? And unfortunately, the core costs today are um, prohibitive to enterprise, you know, adding devices to the private network. Um, in Wi-Fi, there's no extra cost really um, to add devices onto the network. And I know this isn't Wi-Fi, but you know, that's what enterprises are used to. But every time we add a device onto the LT or 5G network, um, there's a cost um, in the core. And that's um, not, um, you know, what we want. You don't want to penalize the enterprise for adding a device to the, the private LT network. We want to remove that penalty. So 
the core vendors out there and the, our industry has to change the cost structures of the core. Um, number four, KPIs. So you have to speak in key performance indicators that are um, business levers, not in um, wireless technology vernacular, okay? And security, number five, is critical, okay? You can't just go in there, and I know LT, look, LT works. You don't have to do POCs all day. Um, it's proven that it works. If you're going to do a POC, you got to do it on the business value, not on whether you get capacity and throughput. I mean, I think LT is pretty proven by now. Um, but you have to secure the network too. And I'm not talking about L securing the wireless part of this is what, what a lot of these enterprises want to use is they want to use a wireless network for IT traffic, for OT traffic, for IOT traffic, et cetera, and for employee smartphones. And they want those all broken out um, and segregated into secure networks on the enterprise network in their LAN. And that's when you need to look at um, zero trust network access or SASE based technologies to integrate that into your product set um, as you go to market. I feel like if you don't come with, if you're not just providing the network, right, you have to come in with a, a ZTNA product with a private LT network. And to be honest with you, with a monetization platform to really present a more holistic solution um, to the enterprise. Um, and then you have this industry dilemma going on right now, which is point number six, is the service providers out there want to own the network, but the enterprises want to own the network. And at the end of the day, who's going to own the network? And I think this is an issue that's being pushed down the hill a little bit and it'll pop up later. Um, so next slide, please. So that's, I just wanted to show, you know, kind of have that conversation because we, we everyone's asking, you know, why things aren't getting adopted and why private mobile networks isn't getting adopted quickly enough. But, you know, we have ourselves to blame also. And I think these are some things we can do on our side to improve it um, and speak more enterprise language. Next slide. And here's just an example, right? So here's um, you know, an example of an industrial manufacturing company. What you see on the left side column here is all your typical network use cases. Okay, yeah, we're gonna do network aggregation, we're gonna do video analytics, you know, we're gonna do push to talk, you know, LMR replacement, we're gonna do employee mobile access. So, you know, this is what we're probably more used to. But what we have to do is get into that column where it says enterprise business value. We have to start speaking in, oh, you're going to have, you know, more, you know, um, process improvement uh, or more productivity or less network downtime or, you know, quantify these business levers into value for the enterprise so that they can say, oh, okay, yeah, I'm going to get this much value and I can justify, you know, what the, what the cost of the network is. Because right now we're all stuck in, oh, here's our TCO. Let's do TCO bake-offs against everybody on this call probably. And they don't care what the cost is as long as it's justified by the benefit. You can take the current cost structures you have now and do it by, multiply by 10 as long as the benefit's 20, 25 times higher, right? Um, so that's my you know, key message here. You have to, and if you can't do it as a company, you have to partner with someone that can or work with the enterprise to do it. And if, if you're just an ethernet switch manufacturer, yeah, you're not gonna do this, but you better pick the right partners that can do it to get these deals done, or you're gonna be stuck in POC, you know, a, a lifetime of POCs. Um, and nobody wants that, because that drives costs up and delays sales and revenue. I imagine a lot of people are under pressure to get revenue um, out of CBRS, and, um, you, know, uh, um, you know, it needs to, you know, we need to help it get there, and it's, it's close, and it's gonna happen. It just needs to happen sooner. Um, next slide. Um, and there was a question that came up, so let me address that. You know, will enterprises prefer network as a service models and manage it themselves? To be honest with you, um, private LT and private 5G networks is too complicated for an, an enterprise to do it right now. So there's no, really no chance that they can do it. Um, unless you had a really sophisticated one like utilities, um, maybe that's, um, the case, you know, it's utilities could do it, but everyone else has to have a service provider do it right now until the product matures and gets to where it is in Wi-Fi, but it's not quite there yet. Um, so, um, you know, we're more than happy to talk about that later. But, you know, if I had to summarize what some of the top things are that the enterprise, uh, the service provider must get right to really um, be successful. And this is a summary of kind of the points that have been made. Spoke, speak enterprise value. Get out of this telecom, you know, um, confusing discussion with them it's you know if you really if you really wanted to have a successful sale you'd have a business case ready to go and take it to the cfo of an enterprise and not even talk to the tech people um, uh, enterprise integration 
is critical, right? So you need to have these enterprise APIs and you're not just talking, hey, we have a mech and we're done now. Um, try to bring the full um, stack of the solution and not just your part of it. So team and partner with the right people, whether that's the security and the monetization along with the RAN and the core, et cetera. Um, don't forget about voice. I mean, voice, you know, and I know people are thinking data first, but, you know, voice is something that's going to be needed. Um, try to get to the lowest cost because it helps, it helps your margin, but really focus on uh, the value that you're delivering to the enterprise and be flexible on CapEx and OpEx, right? So some different industry verticals will want to pay more CapEx, some will want to pay more OpEx, but, you know, we haven't seen um, someone that really wants to pay for it all OpEx and never own the network. Um, we just haven't really seen that very much yet. And then sell through a trusted integrator um, if you're not selling directly. I think the one thing is tele telecom people and te the telecom industry has always had a challenge selling to enterprises and enterprise value. It's nothing new. So partner with people that can sell enterprise value. Um, so I hope that's helpful. I know I went a few minutes over, but I wanted to definitely provide that um, the point of view of what the challenge right now is in getting private mobile networks deployed and sold um, at the enterprise successful. So I hope that's helpful. And welcome to any questions or comments now or um, or any time in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Norman. Uh, that, was, that was really, really good uh, and, and really intriguing on a lot of levels. So I'm just going to remind the audience, um, please do log your questions. I know that Norman took a few uh, during his presentation, but uh, we do have a little bit of time. Uh, we're, we're calling a bit of an audible. Um, our three presentation sessions have gone to two. So we're gonna, we're gonna do a little bit of Q&A. We'd love to get some in from the audience, but um, I'm gonna actually invite Pete back to, to the stage if I could to join us. Um, and while he's coming back, I'm gonna throw out a couple of questions that occurred to me from, from your presentation, Norman. Um, uh, sure. So you were really focusing in on sort of avoiding this, right? Kind of talking past um, the customer. I think, you know, uh, my translation of, of one of your key thesis was that, um, it's not a connectivity sale, if you will. It's it's more about the business value. Um, you know, I think that industrial slide really kind of summed that up. Um, and I was I was thinking um, as you're talking about on one side about yeah, who's likely to deliver the solutions. Um, you had the Wi-Fi and DAS managed solutions providers there, and I agree. I, I think they're going to play a key role here. I'm I'm wondering, you know which group or, or which of those two, um, yeah, which of those two groups or if you will, channels has the, the biggest, I don't know if it's challenge or transition um, to make in order to develop, uh, in order to effectively deliver a private cellular solution. You know, it seems like the Wi-Fi, you know, integrators, managed providers, they, they, you know, they may or may not understand cellular technologies very well. So there's probably that transition or leap that they need to make. And then on the DAS side, it's it's probably more on the relationships, right? They they work with the carriers very closely, um, you know, to to put their um, their signal into a building. They probably know, you know, large public venues, stadiums, airports, shopping malls, and things like that. But but you know, when you start talking about you know healthcare, hospitality, education, you know, whichever enterprise vertical you want to talk about, they may not they may not really understand that market, the business challenges, et cetera, et cetera. So which do you think is better positioned, or, or maybe that's not even a, a valid question? I don't know. Yeah, you know, Dave, I think um, it's a it's a very good question, and I think, to be honest with you, I think they're both challenged a little, you know, quite a bit. Um, and I, I do think that they will have tremendous opportunities to upsell in their industry verticals, and a lot of the Wi-Fi DAS deployments are in venues and airports and things like that. Um, and you know. There's, a, there's two other guys on the panel that could probably, or in this discussion, that can probably answer this question better than I can. But, you know, I would um, I would position it this way. I think, you know, um, I don't think the problem is technology if you're Wi-Fi and DAS, a Wi-Fi or a DAS provider and learning how to deploy a private LT network. I, I really don't think it's a technology problem. I think they're both, um, you know, both of those entities will be capable of, um, you know, deploying a private LT, private 5G network. I think the challenge there is some of the business cases with DAS and Wi-Fi have been selling carrier services, right? And you're, the carrier is the customer versus the airport or the venue. Um, and that was is kind of like a revenue share, right? So um, 
the challenge that those companies have is pivoting from doing carrier services and selling um, to that venue or airport value that they would receive. Um, and that's the challenge, right? So it goes back to enterprise value. So instead of saying, hey, airport, you know, you're going to get connectivity and, you know, um, you're, you're going to all the, we're going to get all the MNOs to be able to, their customers are going to come in here and have good service and the MNOs are going to pay and you're going to get X percentage of this revenue. Now they have to change that discussion. Um, and it's really a sales force, sales effectiveness, sales training issue that their sales forces now have to pivot and then do value, sell value to the airport or the venue. Um, so, and I also don't like it when I see um, companies selling one use case. So let's say it's a push to talk LMR replacement for an airport, right? And and no wonder why they can't justify the spend because they're leaving 80% of the value of the network on the table, right? Yeah. So you have to go get the other value and include that in the business case to justify the spend. So you can't do this narrow sale. It's a consultative sale. It has to be broader. And I think the biggest challenge that both those companies have is is kind of making that leap to enterprise um, value and enterprise sales. Well, in the yeah. city mark, in the city market, you have this similar issue. Um, you know, the IT department or a, or a transportation department or public works or a parks, you know, they, they stumble upon this technology and they believe in it. And, you know, trying to get the value across, you know, the government um, is, is very difficult. The good news is I think Marlon has joined us, so you may have your third presentation. Uh, but, you know, in all honesty, you know, I do what I do largely because I, I, I burnt out on the, the expectation cycle versus the reality cycle of, of new technology adoption. Um, you know, turn of the century, I worked for a billionaire family and we were doing private equity investments, dot com, all this good stuff. And when a bunch of that blew up because of over expectation, um, I, I started a Wi-Fi engineering firm and I was quickly adopted into the University of Pennsylvania's incubator with this new cool technology. And I had the hardest time getting people to understand what Wi-Fi was going to do for them. I mean, literally a year and a half in the incubator and people were still scratching their heads, you know, until I got Wi-Fi implemented into their office space. Right. So I think we have just that general breaking through those barriers of just this inertia, you know, established methods. Uh, that's very hard. But I, I think we're really hitting that curve. And as I mentioned, for cities and, and schools, a lot of this federal funding should go in this direction. Right. Well, thank you very much, Norman and Pete. Really good presentations, both. I think you know I, I like this you know point that it's it's a multifaceted solution ultimately, you know, and you need to make sure you're hitting on all cylinders to to bring all of the value to bear for the customer. Um, so and, and you know how applicable that is really enterprise, industrial, municipal, smart city. It's it's all there. Um, so thank you very much. Appreciate it. And and the good news is, as uh, Pete just said, we have been joined by Marlon Cheers. Um, so Marlon, welcome. Um, thank you. And Marlon's going to give our third presentation of the morning. Um, Marlon is the deputy chief uh, of information technology for the Dallas Independent School District. And we're uh, very excited to hear um, you know, his views and insights in terms of you know, how ONGO can, uh, can provide some solutions for the education sector. So Marlon, with that, it's yours. So thank you for the introduction. I have been since January 16th. I am now the Chief Information Officer at Fort Worth ISD. So a um, little, little bit of a bump, right? But uh, Titles don't matter. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, today, I don't have PowerPoint. Um, didn't want to kill you by Zoom slide. So today I just want to have a, I created an acronym um, that we all love in tech, right? So today uh, the acronym is OGC and it's not Office of the General Counsel, but it's opportunity, um, right? And then it's growth and then it's collaboration. And so, CBRS uh, for me has allowed for an opportunity, right? And that opportunity has to meet um, with a, a, an outcome that provides 
something more than just a return in education, right? There's no money, there's no stakeholder profit, there's no one getting a bonus, right? And so the opportunity that we have is that we can close the digital divide. And it's not often that that opportunity comes, you know, freely, right? And, and, and although there's some cost, and, and I'll talk about part of that cost in the collaboration piece, CBRS is just out there. And so the, the technology or the CIOs of the world have pivoted because of Corona and the digital divide has kind of moved from something that we don't talk about to things that are equity, uh, it has come right up to the top of the discussion for most of us. And so um, when I was at Dallas and also at Fort Worth, we always talked about what could, what would it be like to provide internet access or or connectivity to our students? And, and we started to do it in different ways. We started with bus Wi-Fi and, and saying, okay, while students are on the bus, uh, they'll have connectivity. Uh, we expanded that to some outdoor connectivity where we put access, outdoor access points on some of our high schools or some of our schools to allow the community to be able to come and use guest Wi-Fi and captive portals and things of that nature. And so just as we continue to look at different solutions, CBRS kind of just hit some of us and said, you know, hey, this is a great opportunity to do something that one will help the community right it's not often that tech gets to help the community um and i'll talk about that in growth but also can solve a social economic issue and so the word opportunity is really um for me one of the pillars of cbrs um and something that i think everyone should look at because cbrs is there for somewhat of a nominal cost in the it world it's almost truly free and it's an opportunity, right? So the next thing I wanted to talk about is growth. When I started in IT, um, I started running cable, right? I was a programmer. We were buying node servers, doing databases, coding, running our own cable. Uh, we did everything in K through 12. It was like, you know, unlike private sector, you know, we not a, a genius of one thing. We're kind of like, non-geniuses of a bunch of different things. And so um, one of the things that we noticed is that the growth opportunity in K-12 initially was just around data centers and tech work. Um, it wasn't where we provided, in my opinion, growth that actually helped our stakeholders on a one-to-one -one basis. And so I've seen IT go from buying servers, buying storage to providing one-to-one -one devices, connectivity, looking at data and predictive, predictive analytics, looking at AI and machine learning that actually has impacts on student outcomes. And so the K-12 industry in IT has just changed so dramatically over my 20 years. We've gone from dumping millions of dollars into data centers and things that nobody really cared about to things that actually have impacts on our stakeholders, our students and our communities. And so one of the things that I challenge everyone um, is to say, okay, now that we have this growth, right? Now that we're truly change agents within the IT space, now that we have a seat at the table, we have the CFO's ear, we're, in, we're, we're part of what now is governance, right? where before we always reported to someone, we were begging for money, right? Literally, um, we were playing off the age of equipment to refresh equipment. Uh, we were hoping that we could stretch E-rate to buy things. Um, you know, we were hoping buying year old hardware because the vendor pushed it off on you, right? Those days are now, well, they're not over for some, but for others, we have, a seat at the table where we can use these opportunities, right, to actually make change through the growth of things of the industry of of IT and K twelve education, or even maybe higher ed education. I'm not I'm not sure. So for me, the last piece, and I'll I'll circle around is just on collaboration, right? And this is the part 
that I'll spend the most time on is it's the my pain point in, in, in all of the CBRS, the Ongo Alliance created the opportunity, created the framework, created um, what, what we're using to drive this change. And the hard part is band 48. I'll give you an example, right? So right now we're in a world where the most, the biggest cost is buying modems, right? Uh, you know, if I have a $3 million project, 33% is going to the modem. Much of it isn't even going to licensing the spectrum piece of, of the unlicensed spectrum or the SAS piece. It's not even going to that. It's going to a piece of equipment that is on top of the equipment that I'm already purchasing because most of the devices today don't support band 48. And the ones that do, you know, they cost astronomically way too much to make it a viable solution on a CBRS network. Um, for me, there's a couple of companies that are doing, uh, and I won't mention names because this is not a sales pitch or anything, but there's companies that I, we look for to use CBRS for, for wireless or to use LTE convergence so that you get better cell phone coverage. And all those are be benefits of CBRS um, in addition to closing the digital divide. But the struggle that I have is we need to collaborate so that we can make change continue cost, you know, cost effective for education. And that's going to be in the device space, right? Having devices that support CBRS, support this wonderful technology, being able to extrapolate what we're doing now out to where students don't have to be in their home, right? They can have a device learn anywhere, be anywhere, and, and accomplish the things that they wanna do without being tied to necessarily a modem. And I think that is where we need to collaborate between private sector, education, uh, extending these networks out through county and city and use our powers individually for the greater good. And so the greater good could be the topic of it, um, but there's so much opportunity for growth through collaboration, right? And that's the whole OGC concept. Um, I understand that there's profit on my side, there's cost, but if we come together, the opportunities will be endless. And you can use these words in multitude of different ways to frame the sentence, but at the end of the day, those three words together lead to greater profits because companies will have students that are ready to work in the technical industries that right now we've had gaps since I've been in the eighth grade. When I was in eighth grade, people said the top professions will be lawyer, silver engineer, and technology and, 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 and medicine. And those same, except for lawyer, those same industries still have the same gaps and technology has just increased tremendously if you took away our foreign assets that we use and our offshore assets that we use from a US perspective, it, we would be in a tremendous hole. Um, in K-12 and in the US, we need to strengthen our technology resources. We need to provide students early on access to these technologies, right? And I think CBRS is a game changer because it allows for connectivity. It allows for students to connect and connection and connectivity is the basis for being on the internet, right? And if you have a good device that can connect, can connect to the, the, the internet, then you have the opportunity to play around with something that you didn't understand or have access to. And so if there's a saying in my mentor group, you will be what you see. And if you don't see, technology if you don't in, you know encounter it at a young age you may use it as a consumable but you're not going to be interested in it as a profession and i think industry has to look at creating professionals where sometimes we're looking you know maybe on the consumer side everything is focused around or on the private side everything is focused around the consumer right but the consumer is just a portion 
of the success of a company, right? You have to build better products, right? And so for me, that is strengthening the K-12 space through collaboration. And I'm looking forward to collaborating with all the partners on the Ongo Alliance, uh, the device partners, the CBRS partners on how we can use CBRS at, in our districts to increase connectivity, to increase efficiencies, um, because I do view it as an efficiency. Having cameras that I don't have to hardwire um, is an efficiency and it's a cost savings. And it's, it goes right along with having CBRS. And so the more that we can do in that area, the better education is gonna be, the more money that we can put back into the classroom through technology efficiencies, and all of it is centered around OGC. So I look forward to continued growth. I look forward to continue opportunities. And I look forward to collaborating with everyone on this call to make sure that we continue what everyone has done to enhance it for future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Marlon. Um, and my apologies for um, uh, messing up your title and congratulations on the promotion. Um, that is excellent. Um, you, uh, I was just going to ask, you, you were really honing in on, you know, I guess it's really the, the increased cost that you have to bear um, because of you know, the, the lack of native client support for Band 48. Um, and I was just wondering, you mentioned cameras there at the end. I'm assuming, you know, laptops, tablets, um, you know, are, are there are there specific form factors where, you know, you really you really need to see that band 48 or N48, um, you know, support natively? I think for me, it's, it's really in the laptop space. Um, there's a few tablets on the higher end that support band 48, but I just think that eventually it needs to be something that's put into the consumable, right? At, uh, regardless of price point, um, you know, it's kind of like milk and cereal. It just needs to go together. Right, yeah. I mean, I'm, we're, we're, we're hoping we're making progress on that front. I mean, we've been pretty encouraged by the uptake, but I, I take your point. It's sort of been at the, the high end, um, you know, probably enterprise class, uh, you know, laptop form factor initially. We, we certainly hope that will make it down into the, the mainstream devices soon as well. So, yeah. yep. Well, thank you. I think we um, probably need to transition to our, our panel here, but really appreciate your presentation, Marlon. That was a great way to kind of end this, uh, you know, the three sessions we had this morning. Smart cities, um, enterprise, and then education. I think we heard a lot of common themes around meeting what the actual you know, kind of business and or educational challenges are with the technology. So thank you again, Marlon. All right, thank you. With that, I'm gonna uh, turn this over to Alan Ewing, our executive director, who's going to introduce the panel that we have on the path to 5G. And you know, Alan, I know we're behind, but if, uh, if they wanna to respond to my question about that, uh, you know, Wi-Fi managed service provider versus DAS managed service provider uh, transition, uh, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Over right. to you. Good deal. Thanks, Dave. And uh, thanks to, to all of our speakers thus far. And we, we are inviting back up Norman, uh, who's helping us out on the panel. Uh, so uh, thanks to him. So a little bit of background on, on where we are here with this particular panel. Uh, this panel was originally scheduled back in October uh, for our members meeting there with the path to 5G, 5G being one of those topics that, of course, is uh, on, on the front of everyone's minds. But, um, you know, we decided to delay it. We were going to do it virtually, but then we thought, well, we'll do it in New Orleans. And then, of course, with New Orleans changing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But good news is we have a really nice panel uh, that we've been able to assemble for today and uh, throw out a few questions. I appreciate the, the time's a little shorter than we wanted, but um, we, will, we will manage. And so what I'm going to do is really just kick off and ask our presenters to do a very quick introduction of themselves. Um, mainly who they are, why they're here, and then we'll jump into some questions. So, Robert, I'll, I'll start with you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Rob Serbone, Vice President of Product Management and Marketing for CTS. Uh, CTS is uh, about a 30-year-old DAS system integrator, so I'll be glad to talk to that question uh, that Dave asked. Uh, but we also have, are in the process of uh, transforming into a managed service provider. So we bought a company called 
ClearSky that provides hosted mobile core services for a bunch of tier two and tier three mobile network operators. Um, so we know what it's like to run carrier class services and we're trying to transition uh, or pivot the business into that enterprise business model with a, a full slate of uh, network as a service offerings. Very good, thanks Rob. Uh, Derek? Hey everyone, good to see you uh, virtually. I was uh, also looking forward to seeing you in person, so hopefully next time. But um, uh, I'm with Boingo, as you can kind of see behind me, uh, and um, excited to be here and talk about 5G. And you guys all know my opinion of 5G. There's a big G, which is a marketing thing, and the little G, which is the technology thing. So looking forward to getting into it and uh, with the rest of the panelists. So thanks. Yeah, Derek. Uh, Yosef. Hi everybody, uh, glad to be here. Uh, this is a great topic. And uh, um, so uh, my name is Yusuf Abdelaida. I work for American Tower. And as you know, American Tower from the tower, we do more than tower. We're the largest independent tower company in the world. We're global in over 25 countries. And my role is to really, our mission is to connect everybody and everything. And so CBRS opened that opportunity to uh, enable connectivity to different uh, verticals as well. Very good. And Norman, I think you have an introduction, but go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Uh, Norman Fekrat, um, managing partner at Imagine Wireless. We're a consulting firm, and we do a lot of the strategy work on how to monetize um, CBRS. Very good. So um, I'm going to jump in here with Derek and, and give you the first bite at the apple here with a comment about, so what is the deployment situation uh, when it comes to 5G? And I, I, I think we're, you know, we can argue big G, little G, uh, what, the, what the right one to pick on is. But um, when it comes to the deployment situation, where are we in CBRS with, with 5G? You know, I, I think we're still, uh, if we're talking specifically on the CBRS and 5G, we're still trying to make sure we get all those use cases out for the 4G right now. All, you know, the 4Gs are happening, um, you know, as kind of shared by some of the panelists, the devices have made it challenging in certain cases where you end up having to expend more money to, you know, get a camera connected to CBRS. They don't come natively, so you have to come up with some kind of a dongle solution or some other solution to make it work. So, so those kind of things are still, I, I think, where we're at is focusing in on those use cases, which is what I call the big 5G, which is, hey, use everything, use OnGo, use uh, DAS, use Wi-Fi, use LoRa, use everything. And that's right. the big 5G is really just recognizing that. On the little 5G is actually taking the 5G, uh, um, you know, spec, 3GPP specs and putting it out there and making it available. Um, those are, of course, um, coming and they're part of the evolutionary process we're going through. I think a big part of the deployment strategy, at least for us in a neutral host situation, is us getting uh, slicing mm -hmm. working. Because once we get slicing working, then we can really take advantage of the rest of that spectrum for everybody and for all the use cases in the in the venues that we support. So open it up, uh, Rob. How about uh, from your perspective on that? Any anything to to add? No, I think I largely agree with Derek. I mean, we we've got a couple of end user devices that are out there today that support um, N48, so 5G band in the in the CBRS band, you know, but it's very high-end devices, iPhone 13, the Galaxy S21 Ultra, um, you know, and we're still working with a lot of the radio OEMs to understand the timelines for their availability. I mean, largely these radios are gonna require kind of a rip and replace. Um, there aren't a lot of folks that are doing something where you can put out an LTE radio today and upgrade it. There's a, there's a couple, JMA and, and Ericsson, you'd be able to put something out today and upgrade it. Uh, but the only thing that seems at this point that's really readily available are the cores. You know, we've got 5G cores out there. I think the OEMs on that side are actively testing with all the radio vendors. And, you know, by the second half of the year, I think we'll see more widespread availability of the networks. In the near term, you know, I, I agree again with Derek. A lot of this is, is marketing hype. The car carriers are punching out a lot of information on the 5G side. So all the CIOs and CTOs here, 5G, 5G, 5G. Um, the carriers, it's all about getting, you know, the edge node closer to the enterprise. I mean, most of the deployments we're doing today, we're putting an edge node in the enterprise. So there's a lot of performance benefits that we get today on LTE 
that you know that that are consistent with what we would see on the 5G side. Maybe not as good, but I think we can satisfy you know 90% of the use cases today where we can get a very low latency service on the order of you know 10 mm -hmm. milliseconds um, performance and meet most of the use cases. I mean, I don't think that there's a, and I think Norman mentioned this as well, yeah. it's really got to focus on those use cases. What are you trying to do and, and do you really need 5G or not? That's what, that's exactly what I was thinking is, is kind of going to Norman here and, and, you know, what we discussed earlier in his presentation is, is where is the right fit as well is, is a critical part of this really, I think. So, so Norman, maybe, you know, refresh us in case anyone kind of phased out earlier, but where is that break for us uh, when when 5G becomes important for particular applications? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, what we're seeing, um, you know, is LT, like what Rob and Derek said, is LT meets a lot of the requirements that are there today. And if you get a, a more sophisticated enterprise that actually knows, you know, what their KPIs are, mm -hmm. the better off you're going to be at closing a deal, I think. Because then they'll understand um, that, you know, the hype on 5G just isn't really... It's not there yet, but it's also not needed. Um, we think LT is going to be a great business opportunity for a lot of managed services providers for a long time. Um, uh, you know, when we get into the 5G space, you know, we look at, you know, G Node B versus ORAN and whether that's going to be the right solution for an enterprise or not. Um, and I think on the ORAN side, if you start, if someone could productize that and make an, an SLA kind of you know guaranteed SLA or meet a latency requirement, I think that can move the needle a little bit. Um, and maybe the cost of ORAN would be actually lower than a G node B right. um, cost structure. So there's the economics, there's interest in the cost structures and economics of ORAN versus G node B. The only other comment I would make is to what Rob said, the MEC is you know really important to latency. And if they don't have a and that's where I think you know the enterprises, a lot of the enterprises that are doing industrial manufacturing or, you know, an example is DHL, right? DHL has these um, smart glasses they want to use on their employers and they want to pick packages the right way and understand what the packages are. So it's kind of like a smart glasses AR, but the latency on that thing needs to be pretty quick because the packages are going by really fast. So, you know, if it's a one millisecond latency, you know, I don't know, maybe you would need 5G, but if it's five to 10, I think Rob, you know, if you can see, if you can do 10 milliseconds in LTE, you can meet 90% of those latency requirements is my guess. Um, so I think where the mech is positioned along the architecture, whether it's in the enterprise or pulled back in a telco core, will, you know, obviously the distance mm -hmm. to go further away increases the uh, latency. Um, Deals with the latency issue, yeah. certainly. You know, Yosef, I, I, I think um, we've maybe even talked about this in the past is this idea of uh, kind of the field of dreams effect, build it and they will come. And that's always been, I think, a little bit of what the, the telecom world has been about is we, we've tended to build ahead of ourselves in some respects. And so what what is, you know, in light of those kinds of applications, you know, what are the kinds of things that will come uh, that we're that we're having trouble seeing right now? The, you know, the things like the latency issue are solving and, and um, uh, primarily. So are there any ideas that you have along those lines? Well, I think uh, uh, it, it's hard to build something and they come, but I think one thing, looking at all the evolution of uh, 4G and 5G, first of all, let me just get back here to what Norman said, which I totally agree, is really having to nail the use case, and 80% of the use case could be done today with private LTE. They are about 20%, which is dealing with um, EMBB and ultra reliable and low latency that needs 5G. However, I think people is testing right now and doing a lot of plug on 5G on CBRS band to uh, understand the performance enhancement from 4G to 5G. The question that, in my opinion, should be asked is what kind of infrastructure you need to deploy because people are making the investment today for the next few years, 10 to 20 years. Uh, the speaker earlier talked about smart city. There are applications there we're actually going to require 5G. When you talk about smart transportation, connected vehicle and autonomous vehicle, we're going to need really ultra low latency and reliable connectivity that is secure. That's going to need 5G, but what kind of infrastructure you will have to deploy? Because if you're making the investment, according to the speaker earlier, there's like a billion of dollars of infrastructure. What kind of, what kind of infrastructure you need to deploy? Do you need more fiber? Do you need more, uh, you know, what kind of Ethernet cable do you need to deploy? Because some of the old uh, Ethernet cable cannot even support the next generation Wi-Fi 6 and 6E. So these are goes in the heart of what 
uh, Norman has said earlier about the TCO. So there are two things that needs to really have. First of all, you need to drive the cost down to his suggestion of ORAN is we move to virtualization and software that also gonna drive the operation cost down. So you need to maintain that. But CBRS open an opportunity to test all these. And that's the beauty of CBRS. You said, what can we do? I think we can, it's a chicken and egg question here. You, you, you cannot wait till you know all the 5G is complete because one of the nice thing about the GTP, what they've done is the iterative process of releasing the 5G spec. So a lot of the, um, both the infrastructure, uh, like ourselves, uh, as well as OEM and what have you, they can start looking at this uh, use case, like Norman mentioned, the VR and ER that require also low, low latency, maybe connected vehicle and other, that really brings the value. Is he really, well, totally I agree with his uh, uh, presentation, that we can capture the value that hopefully can help scale that. But CBRS is here, and everything starts in the spectrum. And that's, to me, it's, it's an opportunity for all of us to start experimenting and figure out not only what, what that uh, to drive the cost down, but what is that business model to help us scale beyond the technology? Right. You know, that, that's an interesting point. It kind of leads into my, my next question, and Rob, I'll, I'll throw it to you, is there, you know, misinformation is, uh, is endemic and, or pandemic uh, for, on almost every topic, but when it comes to 5G, there does seem to be a lot of misinformation out there, and there's a lot of confusion. So what is, what kinds of information, you know, misinformation is there in regards to 5G deployments and CBRS? And what can we do to, to address them? You know, is there, are there strategies we can use uh, to help offset some of that? I mean, I think the biggest one is really just the, the carrier marketing on the, on the public network side of the performance and the throughput, right? I mean, we're not gonna mm -hmm. see the amount of throughput that the carriers are going to see using the millimeter wave bands because they've got much, much more spectrum, mm -hmm. um, worse propagation, but they've got a lot more spectrum. So uh, I think, uh, you know, we're definitely going to see better improved performance on the over LTE. Um, like I said, both on the latency side and the EMBB, as Yusuf mentioned. Uh, but that's that's really, I think, the biggest one. And then, you know, you do have a lot of folks, even in our industry, that, you know, are claiming that they're doing 5G today. Um, and it's, you know, we know that's not, that's not really true. And, and I'm not trying to pull back on 5G or be a bearish on it. It's just kind of the reality that, you know, there's things that we can do today, right? There are, we can slice the networks today. You know, LTE allows for that at a very basic level. Um, we've got some things that we're doing with deep packet inspection where we, uh, you know, we get closer to kind of network slicing in terms of what you can do right. in 5G. Um, but it's really just the, it's, it's, I, it's like Derek said, it's the marketing piece. <laughs> People are out there talking about it a little too much and customers don't really understand exactly what it means to their business. And if we can really get back to talking about the use mm. cases and what they're actually trying to do to transform their business, we can have a more rational discussion. Yeah, I know. I appreciate that, Rob. Yeah, and, I, and Derek, I see you laughing because, yeah, this really feeds into your, your, your big G, little G observation again, yeah. too. Well, I, I also I always laugh because I have friends who are not in the obviously don't do what we all do, and when their phone disconnects as we're driving up a mountainside, they're like going, "Why they have all these carriers are talking about how I have 5G? Well, how the hell am I getting disconnected? Because they said I I should have coverage everywhere, ubiquitous coverage everywhere, right? And I think that we all know that that's hard to do, right? And and we heard some from some panelists before about you know, the, we're investing, uh, you know, here in the United States in broadband and trying to bring more connections rurally. And I, and I agree with a lot of what the panelists said previously. I think that one of the things that we have to, we always talk about is this ultra low latency and all these ultra low latency cases, but probably just as important is trying to get coverage everywhere. And we're not gonna get 5G coverage with millimeter wave everywhere, right? We're gonna end up having to get, uh, different kinds of coverage uh, everywhere. And so really to me, that's where the big G comes in is we need the government involvement. We're starting to see them getting involved in these uh, money that they're providing and, and for broadband and for rural and for trying to get CBRS into the education system as we just heard from Marlon. So I think that things are going the right way. So the hype isn't as bad, the hype isn't bad because it's making us realize we need all these things. It's just that we need to continue to realize that it's not that little G that everybody thinks about where it's like, okay, I've got, you know, release 16 and I'm supporting, you know, as one, one of the questions was this non-public network 
uh, capabilities, you know, we're not going to have that yet. We don't even have the standards and all that yet, but we're still marching that way. So it's an evolutionary process that we all need to be a part of. And 4G and all these other technologies that we have available are part of it. Norman, how about from your perspective on, on the misinformation side? Well, I, I would just be happy that, an, you know, a mobile network operator can't deploy 5G on C-band near an airport now, so now you can go sell them a private 5G network on CBRS. <laughs> <laughs> well. Um, <laughs> I think it's, I mean, I don't, I think, um, I mean, I think the point here is, you know, LT is solid and good and, you know, there is there is a path to 5G, you know, there will be a path to 6G and, and all this stuff. And if you got to listen to the enterprise customer, right? And mm -hmm. I think our challenge now with, you know, a path to anything is to private networks overall is really getting this enterprise customer to understand the benefit and what the technology can do for them. And, you know, us speaking more in their language, as I said earlier, but it's really about what this is, it plays a role in an overall digital transformation that they're trying to, you know, um, go through and understanding the role that, you know, 5G or 5G, 4G or 5G plays in that is critical. Um, right. There's a lot of hype out there. Um, the MNOs do that quite a bit. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you get all these CTOs that say, hey, well, we want private 5G. We can do that now, right? And, um, and then, it makes it makes the sale process probably longer and more more difficult to say no. You really need 4G now, and oh, isn't that worse? You know, yeah. why would I go to a lower technology? I want 5G now, and right. you know, I think they're creating a disservice to enterprises' understanding of what the technology does and what's out there today. Pretty good. So, Yosef, um, you know, making that transition. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about uh, maybe some of the misinformation, but what are we what are we looking for when it comes for applications? You know, obviously we've we've talked about many use cases, et cetera, but are there specific applications um, that need to be capable in 5G uh, that we haven't talked about yet? I know we've talked about several of them, but maybe explore some of those ideas. Yeah, I mean, like everybody, everybody in the panel said, I mean. The, as I said much earlier, the use case you can do today with 4G. Again, I go back to what I said earlier. It's about the infrastructure that you make an investments because you're going to bury cabling. You go in the city of Boston, for example, if you bury something in the city, it has to look like you looked to, you know, 300 years ago. So that cannot be marginalized. Is really have to understand, look ahead, the 5G and 6G, what I need to, to, to invest in because that's what the enterprise wants to do show me exactly the infrastructure going to give me some of this technology proofing right to be able to do that then you have to also look at the use case as norman uh, highlighted that you can solve today with 4g and, work, and 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 also enable them to say okay here are the oem that give you an easy upgrade to 5g either via software or rip and replace just at least the radio you can replace this radio later in terms of use cases that are 5g i believe uh, like i mentioned earlier some of the advanced use cases, specifically industry 4.0, they use industry Ethernet today. They're not, not going to disconnect till they make sure they have that low latency and reliable connectivity, not only from the coverage perspective, but from mobility, because they use AGVs with advanced 3D uh, cameras uh, for using some AI to inference the object in the manufacturer. Because when you talk about industry 4.0, for example, the manufacturer, when they lift one object, a widget from a line A to line B, Efficiency go beyond just the latency of the connectivity. It has to do the, the fact they can guarantee they can produce this many widget by this amount of time because it has an impact on their revenue. So these are some of the advanced application where 5G, you know, uh, would be needed um, till and, and is proven. They're not gonna, you know, cut that cable and go there. So ultimately, uh, as the panel here mentioned, I like to add is that it's not about having the next G. It's really having a tool in your toolbox which enabling a multiple technology and you have the right infrastructure, uh, what I call shared digital infrastructure. That's why the, you know, uh, in CBRS Alliance working on neutral host, how do you drive the cost down to enable uh, basically all this multi-application, whether it's on 4G, whether it's on Wi-Fi, was it a narrow band IoT, or whether in 5G when it's here, do I have to make the right investment that enable all this technology to meet my needs? Very good. Uh, thanks, Joseph. So um, I'm going to start wrapping things up, but I want to ask, um, you know, Robert, Derek, uh, and Norman, 
because I think, Joseph, you kind of set the stage for this is, you know, in the path to 5G, Rob, um, what, what one thing should people take away that we haven't discussed thus far? Huh. I think it's really, I would say be patient, I think, um, you know, and be measured. I mean, I understand that there's a, you know, I understand the value and why people are asking for 5G today, right? They don't want to put something in and have to upgrade it in two or three years, right? They're looking for a future-proof solution. Um, you know, as Norman said, I think it's, you know, once you get 5G in, then we're going to be looking at 6G. So I don't, I don't know that you ever get that. And I do agree with Yusuf. I mean, you've got to make sure that the infrastructure that the network is sitting, the RAN is sitting on top of mm. is kind of future-proof, right? And so, I mean, I think there's a lot that can be done to deploy right. some of these fiber networks underlying to power the the RAN kind of going forward and make sure that you've got that future proof option. But um, like we're seeing today on the LTE side, you know, these deployments are a little bit of a, you know, science projects. You've got to combine like, you know, a dongle or a, or a LTE gateway with a camera and, you know, you've got to kind of get creative. And frankly, we end up spending a lot of time, I would say more on the solution engineering part of things for these networks to try and validate some of these use cases for the customer because it's not um, obvious kind of how to do that today. And I think we're just mm -hmm. starting to see the LTE chips now, you know, go into some of these special purpose devices. And so, you know, 5G, we're just seeing the handsets today. So it's going to take a little bit of time for that whole ecosystem to evolve. So that's why I say be patient. Good, good, good words, uh, Rob. Thanks. Derek, how about from your perspective? What? Uh... Yeah. You know, I'll take a different approach and, and I'll say, you know, in 4G, it was, hey, you know, we're going to still focus in on networks. 5G, we're focusing in on use cases. And I think that that's key. Um, and we're focusing on how to build those use cases. And I think that, as Rob said, there's a lot of learning going on and a lot of uh, solutions engineering we're having to do to make those use cases work. And what I really think that we're moving towards, and that's why I love being a part of OnGo is, we're moving towards this idea that in the future, it's all about shared networks, right? And it's because our use cases are going to be shared, right? There's going to be lots of use cases as well. You know, we don't just have one app on our phone making voice calls anymore. It's got a hundred and thousands of things on there. I'm betting, I'm doing everything mm -hmm. else. I'm ordering food. I'm doing all this stuff now at a venue that before I didn't use my device for, right? Yeah, I, was, I just right. used it to make phone calls. So this idea of sharing that we've seen happen on the handsets, it's gonna happen in the networks. And so to me, moving sharing forward is a big part of what 5G is going to end up enabling. And so when we get into 60, it's gonna be just, hey, we're sharing everything and let's just make sharing really work. So that's yeah. kind of the way I look at it. And, and so to me, it's always evolution. And so we're in the right evolution path just remember, it's an evolution. We're not there yet. And so, uh, as Rob said, so just keep evolving. Good deal. Last words, Norman. Um, you, you, get to, you get to have the final say here. You know, I, I'd probably, um, I think, you know, Yusuf said, you know, the underlying infrastructure in Ethernet, I think that's very important. You know, Rob said, let's be patient. Um, Derek said, shared infrastructure um, moving forward. I think those are all key items. So one, the only thing I would, probably add to that is um, let's not overcomplicate this thing because when you start looking at ORAN, now we got to deal with front hall, we got to deal with mid hall and back hall. And um, it just gets more complicated to the enterprise. And my and now you got to add like, you know, latency switches in there, ethernet switches and front hall and mid hall and then right. the cost. And, you know, the whole objective of ORAN was to be cheaper than G B, right? And I think it's, I think it's going to get there because and it's got to be simple because you can't take this to an enterprise and say oh yeah guess what you can support 10 different rands and you know these du's and cu's and isn't it great um <laughs> but it may just be complicated to them so i think we owe it to package this up and make it as simple um to the enterprise as possible and not over complicate it with adding all these different components to it Excellent. Well, thank you all uh, for this. We're up against our time. We did get a couple of questions. I'll make sure to get those out to you gentlemen uh, so we can collect an answer and, and give that to our audience as well as part of the collateral. And just a reminder, we will have the recording, we will have the slides that were presented, and we'll have any questions that we uh, captured along the way as part of the materials that we will upload for, for later review. So 
you didn't miss anything, um, or if you want to share with your colleagues, don't worry, it'll be available. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you to all of our presenters today. I think a really interesting uh, set of observations for us that we can share, and that uh, again, this is a this continues to be a fun ride, and one that uh, should keep us all both um, entertained, educated, and and really feeling like we're you know helping provide some some unique, valuable services to to the world. So uh, thank you all, and look forward to talking with you more. Uh, with that, um, Dave is uh, Dave has had to take off uh, a little bit early, or not a little bit early because we're running a little bit late. So just ask me to close things down. Would say thank you. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Again, everybody, please stay safe, stay well, and uh, we'll have uh, I believe some sessions for the working group starting up in about 25 minutes. So if you are interested in those working groups, part participating in those. Uh, those will fire up in about 25 minutes. Uh, everybody enjoy the rest of your, what is today, Wednesday. Uh, so, <laughs> and uh, everybody take care. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Bye -bye.